Hey everyone, how's it going? So we're going to continue our discussion of kernels by talking about what I think is the most powerful kernel of all when we talk about SVM, and that is the radial basis function kernel. So you might have heard of this called the RBF kernel sometimes. And the reason it's so powerful at a high level is that it's able to take into account really weird, strange, non-regular decision boundaries where it's not linear, it's not like quadratic, it's not anything nice, it can be really weird as we might very naturally have in the real world. And it's still able to solve the SVM problem and separate the two classes fairly well in many of those situations. And of course the question is why is it able to do this? And let's go to the goal of this kernel. So the goal of this kernel, for example, if you're dealing with some naturally two-dimensional data that has some x1 and x2 coordinate. Of course, we know that with kernels, we're trying to project our data into higher dimensional space. And the goal of the radial basis function kernel kind of takes this idea to its extreme. It says that I don't want to stop by just considering the one-way interactions between my variables, which are just the variables themselves. I don't want to stop at considering just the two interactions where I consider one variable and another variable. I don't want to stop at three. Actually, I want to consider the infinite number of interactions between my variables. And just already, that seems insane. And that's why this kernel was hard for me to grasp, why it's hard for a lot of students to grasp, is like, what does that even mean to consider the infinite interactions between these variables? For example, you have to consider the three interactions, the four interactions, the five, but you just got to keep going. And when we look at our diagram again, so we had this diagram in our intro kernels video, and we talked about how we're trying to go from the original data, which is this x1, x2, and we're trying to eventually get to the transformed inner products, which means after we do whatever transformation we're trying to do, we need to get all the inner products between the transform vectors. And we said in the previous video that if we go this route, where we actually transform the data and have that data living in memory, and then we go ahead and take the inner products of those, that can be inefficient, that can be require a lot of data storage, but in this case, it's actually much worse than that. It's just impossible. When you think about projecting your data into an infinite dimensional space, and you're like, okay, I actually want to get those transformations, you literally can't. There's not enough room on your computer to store infinite data. So we literally cannot go down this route. So we're forced to go down the other route we talked about, which tends to be more efficient when we're dealing with very high dimensional data like this. And that other route involves first taking the inner products between the original variables, which is easy because the original variables live in a two-dimensional space. And then the tricky part is going from those original inner products and using some kind of well-constructed kernel function to get to those transformed inner products without ever actually doing the transformation. And so, of course, the question is, how does the radial basis function actually formulate its kernel? And what I'll do is show you the formulation, and then we'll kind of back derive, which means we're going to show that if we write the kernel in this way, it does actually solve the goal or achieve the goal of getting an infinite dimensional projection of your original data. So let's start from the actual definition. The radial basis function kernel of xi and xj is given by e, which is Euler's number, to the power of negative one half, the norm of xi minus xj squared, and that's the L2 norm. So, okay, it's not clear how that amounts to projecting anything into an infinite dimensional space, but let's uh, do a little bit of algebra and see if we can get this into a form that makes more sense to us. The first thing I'll do is say that xi minus xj's norm squared is equivalently written as the transpose of this difference and then the difference itself. So that's just a fact about vectors. And then I can actually break up this inner part so I can distribute all the terms. So I get xi transpose xi minus 2 xi transpose xj plus xj transpose xj. So I have this now. And then what I'll do is break up this single exponent as two exponents because I want two distinct terms. The first is going to collect this term with just the i's and then this term with just the j's, so that goes into the first term, and the other term will collect this guy. The negative 2 and the negative 1 half nicely cancel out to become an exponent of 1, so we get e to the xi transpose xj. Now the reason I did this is because now we can easily see that, note that this function, which before didn't seem to have anything naturally to do with the inner products between our original data, can be expressed exactly only in terms of inner products of our original data. For example, if you look at all the x's in this form here, you see that they only come in the form of inner products between the data and some other vector in the data. So in fact, this is a kernel function because we are able to express this function only in terms of inner products of our original data, which is important because that's the only way you would be justified to go from here to here using this thing we're calling a kernel function. So that's a good first thing to note. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this big part here the first e to the power of thing, just as some constant c, because I don't want to worry about it too much. And the other one I'm going to leave it as it is. 
Now let's follow this arrow up here. Let's we'll do a little bit more algebra. So this next step isn't absolutely necessary, but I wanted to draw as many parallels to the original kernels video as possible. And so what I'm going to do is add and subtract 1 to the exponent. Hopefully you agree that doesn't change anything. And so I get c e to the power of xi transpose xj plus 1, and then just e to the minus 1 as well. And I'll just absorb this e to the negative 1 into the constant c, and I'll just call it c prime. So now what we're looking at is that this original kernel is equal to c prime e to the xi transpose xj plus 1. Now here's where this concept of infinity comes in. If you think back to your original algebra classes, and when you first learn this definition of what does it mean to do e to the x, believe it or not, this might be a long time when you haven't learned this and you've been using the exponential function the whole time, but e to the x is defined as an infinite sum. Specifically, this definition of e to the x is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of whatever thing is in the exponent, which in our case is this guy, to the power of n divided by n factorial. And that's actually the definition of e, Euler's number. And so we're okay to write it like that. And now, the last thing to note, which is going to tie this whole thing together, is that if you think back to our original kernels video, which is linked below, by the way, I highly, highly recommend or require actually watching that to understand this pretty well. We see that this numerator here, 1 plus xi transpose xj to the power of n, is exactly the definition of our polynomial kernel of degree n. So if you go back to that video, you'll see that's exactly the definition. And so we can write k poly degree n of xi transpose xj. And of course, that's all divided by n factorial. What does this mean? So let's kind of go back to a high level. And what we just showed is that this thing that we call the RBF kernel, which is expressed pretty cleanly like this, easy to compute. It's just e to the power of something, which is pretty efficient to do, can equivalently be expressed as an infinite sum of polynomial kernels, each of which is increasing in degree from the last. And what that means is that using this very innocent closed looking form, we're actually able to consider all of the infinite interactions, all of these one, two, three, four, five, all these infinite degree interactions between our original data. And that is the power. From there comes the power of the RBF kernel, the radial basis function kernel. So that, that's really it. I mean, like, we've showed the fact that this can be written as this, and therefore it is actually giving you the power to do an infinite dimensional projection without ever actually having to do that infinite dimensional projection, because that's impossible. Um, so I hope this continues to blow your mind, because even though I understand it well now, um, I hope you understand it well too, it's still kind of a mind-blowing concept that you can achieve the benefits of an infinite dimensional projection without ever visiting that infinite space. So that's just one of the cool things about kernels. And I uh, hope you like this video. Please like and subscribe for more. And I'll see you next time.